He does love us, and hopefully you've experienced that love. And if you haven't, <coughs> somehow you get that message. And, uh, because that's the only way to do it in this life, by accepting the love and grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, I'm going to tell you like Liz Taylor told her first nine husbands. I'm not going to keep you very long. Uh, the, uh, but anyway, we're going to get right into this. And, uh, we've been going through the book of Genesis. And uh, we have uh, covered the first five chapters to an extent. Now, if you want to get more into this, then you need to study on your own. The Scripture says the Bereans went and searched the Scripture daily to see if what the Apostle Paul was telling him, whether or not it was true. They studied daily. So I encourage you, I challenge you, study on a daily basis. Get in the Word. Uh, look at some of these things because there's so much in here that we could cover for a long period of time. I'm going to try to turn my mic on. Can I do that? Yep. See if it works. Okay. This is for recording purposes. And plus, I know how much y'all love hearing my voice more loudly and crispier and... Isn't it crispier? I like hotter. Uh, Christian. Anyway, let's continue on. We've been going through, and we're in Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, and last week, remember we talked about the genealogy, and we talked about Enoch and how Enoch walked with God, and Enoch did not see death, but God carried him uh, away. We talked about the faith of Enoch and walking with God is what we discussed from Genesis chapter 5. Well, this week, I want to look uh, just simply at the first eight verses. And I'm going to read this. There's not a whole lot on the screen. It just simply says, the sorrows of God, or basically the sorrow of God is what it is. And so let's look at this. Verse, uh, verse six, or chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. It says, Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, all of whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came uh, in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of his thoughts of his thoughts was evil, and was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, fruit and thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now there's all kinds of things up here at the very beginning that people like to get into and they like to debate. We have started from the, in Genesis chapter 1, we gave evidence for the existence of God and laid out and that the scripture never claimed to be uh, some science book that was going to give you every intricate part and every detail of everything that's there. It simply starts from the very beginning. In the beginning, God. And then we look at the evidence that was th that is there, this even scientific evidence that's there today faced with other evidence, and we can see that there is enough evidence that if you took it to a court of law and put the evidence that there's not a God to the evidence that there is a God, that an open-minded, being open-hearted, not coming in with preconceived ideas, there's enough evidence to point to the fact that there is a God. I believe in God. I believe in the Bible. I believe in what it says. Now we have here in Genesis chapter 6, we have some interesting things taking place. And it talks about these sons of God. People are like, what are these? Who are these sons of God? What does this mean? Some people believe, and, uh, and different scholars believe that these were some of the fallen angels that we read about in 2 Peter, and we read about in the book of Jude, verses 6 and 7, that, were, that fell when uh, Satan fell. We did a study on Satan on a Sunday night, not too awful long ago. But when Satan fell, you can read about that in Isaiah, in Ezekiel, in the book of Luke, where Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Uh, but we see these, one of the, and, and his angels, some of the angels went with Satan. When he fell, they were cast out as well. They are in chains and bound for judgment is what the Scripture teaches us. And so we have, some people believe that these were the angels that came down and they're created beings and they, these created supernatural beings were then uh, laid and 
became, and had relations with human women. Now some believe that, and as a result of this, there are these giants that came on the land for a while in this kind of super group of people and warriors for a time being that eventually died off. Now there's some that believe that. There are some that believe these are just ones who were ancestors of Seth, because if you remember, Cain killed Abel, uh, so Abel is dead. The Bible then says that Adam and Eve uh, began <coughs> Seth. And so some believe that as they multiply, these are the descendants of Seth, which are the ones that were striving to follow God, striving to do the right thing, but they intermingled and intermarried with the descendants of Cain. And that as a result came about these people. Now regardless of what it is, I don't exactly know. I'll be honest with you. But I believe in the Scripture and I believe in the Word and I can look at both sides and kind of see. But the thing is, the bottom line is that people in this day and time became evil. Now it talks about there were some giants on the land. That's interesting too. We talked about that. Could people uh, exist and be tall? Some people believe these giants at a particular time, some were 9 to 10 feet tall. People are like, oh, you're crazy. But if you were here on Sunday night when Gary preached, he showed a man on our screen who was, over, who was 9 foot tall, basically. For all intents and purposes, he was nine foot tall. That's something. I pray that Eli will at least be six foot seven. <laughs> six foot seven is all I need. Is him with his athletic ability, six foot seven, six foot eight, agile as he is, and uh, I can retire on that. So I think five foot seven is good. <laughs> but anyway, there was uh, there were these giants. That, that were on the land. And, uh, and it talks about them. So if you remember Numbers chapter 13, there were some bigger people that were Numbers chapter 13. When uh, the spies, when the, the people of Israel were going to go into the land of Canaan, and God said, This is the land I'm giving you. So they were going to go scout it out for themselves. And they sent 12 men to scout it out, and they saw that the men there, the, the men there were big men. They were big. And so they were scared. And they came back in fear. Caleb wasn't afraid. Joshua wasn't afraid. And, uh, and then we read about Goliath. Goliath, the Bible says, was over nine feet tall. Maybe he was from this, this uh, group of people, these giants that they're talking about later on that did exist. Uh, but he was over nine feet tall. And I love that story. Well. You know, we love hearing about David and Goliath. And David comes and David defeats uh, Goliath. He's like, who is this guy? Why won't anybody go and fight this guy? He's, he's talking about our God. He's putting our God down. Nobody will go fight him. And they said David was a little fellow, ruddy. I like that. In David, a good time. <laughs> Short and ruddy. But good looking. <laughs> Read the scripture. The, uh, but David, a warrior, Saul has killed his thousands. David, his tens of thousands. In David, by the But David said, hey, Who's this guy talking junk about our God? I'm not going to take this. He goes down there and he defeats uh, Goliath. When everybody else was afraid, he went out there. And that's what this group of people did. It seems like, and these giants were in the land from Genesis 6 and coordinate with this. These sons, these, these sons of God, laid with these daughters, however it happened, evil comes along. They're giants. They're, they're, they seem to be this, this race that's bigger than most. And, and then they're intimidated. And they're oppressing people and, and intimidating people. And uh, you know, we later on we see David standing up against one. They say, "Hey, our God is bigger than anybody else that's out there." We need to realize that. That's a lesson that we can learn. Our God is bigger than anything that's out there. Anybody that's out there. Anybody putting down our God, doing different things. We need to stand up for what is right. We do it in love, but let's not back down and be afraid. When the government starts coming down on us and telling us what we have to believe, I'm going to believe this and what the Word says. When different, one, when different ones in society tell me I'm intellectually weak and uh, religion is my crutch and all these different things, I'm going to smile as big as I possibly can and I'm going to stand up for this. And I'm going to stand on the Word of God. And that's what we have to do as these giants and these things come in and this evil comes in amongst us. We need to stand up for what is right at all times. And this is why I like this. There's a sad verse that later on comes into here. I was telling the kid today, Ken and I in our prayer time at 9 o'clock, I was telling him, I thought about one of, this is one of the saddest verses, but another sad verse in Scripture, one of the saddest, is when Samson, it says of Samson, the Holy Spirit left him 
and he did not know it. That's sad. That the presence of God had left Samson and he didn't even realize it because of the way in which he was living his life. This verse right here is a sad verse in verse 6. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth and he had in his heart. All this evil, all these things going on, and, and he says, I'm sorry for what it made. Some people have taken this, oh, so God, some translators say God repented. Such so, also God repented, God can change my God, this is not the same. And people take this, but this expression of sorrow, it was an expression of sorrow of what people had done to themselves. It says a parent might express sorrow and, and grieving in his heart over a rebellious child. And then go their way. And so he looks down and he sees he has, because what we read in Scripture, this is the thing we've got to understand too as we read Scripture. God is not human. We have to understand God is not human. You get that? So as we read Scripture, it says He grieved His heart, sorry, sorry. We automatically think that's like us. But God, in the, the best way that He possibly can, through the Holy Spirit, is trying to relate to us so that we can understand what He is dealing with and what He's doing. Because God is a spirit. When we're created in the image of God, we are created with a spirit. God is eternal. When we're created in the image of God, we were created to be eternal. Because as Ken said today, we go to sleep and then we're going to be raised to live with the Lord forever and ever. And so but everybody's going to live somewhere forever and ever. Those that are die in the Lord are the ones that are going to be with the Lord. And so we, we were created God in that way. But God, that's why when you hear that God came down and talk about the finger of God or God walking somewhere, those are what are called theophanies. That's a big word in it. Y'all thinking, DJ, man, this guy, I'm so glad that he's here with us because he's so smart. <laughs> right? He's so smart. It took me all week to get that word, theophany, theophany. I've been saying it three to five times a day just so that I could get to this point and stand up and use that word today. How can I use the word theophany? And I didn't. But theophany is the, uh, is the aspect in theology of taking God, taking on physical attributes to relate to us. And so this is kind of a theophany in a way of God expressing this, but God is just sorrowful that they are caught up in all of this sin and that the people chose sin instead of God. He created them and from the very beginning of the day He gave them a free will choice and they made this choice. And then we see when Enoch what, oh, uh, came went this way, Abel went this way. We see it all the way through this eternal struggle. Some choosing God. Some choosing sin. And on and on it goes. And now God's got to the point where He looks down and He's like, man, pretty much everybody down there is choosing evil. They're doing what they want to do. They have no regard whatsoever for what I want them to do. And then it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Isn't that neat? Yeah. All this evil going on. And you can imagine, the Bible teaches us bad company corrupts good morals. And when we're around, I tell people all the time, when you're around bad people, bad things can happen. And usually it does. I know that... Uh, it was funny. There was a uh, there was a kid in my youth group when I was growing up. Kid was in front of everybody. He was one of the real. He's like Eddie Hat. Y'all remember Eddie Hat? Anybody in here remember leaving the yeah. Okay, about three of y'all. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I appreciate the participation a lot. The uh, but Eddie Hat was always you know, kind of nice in front of everybody. And then behind the scenes, he was kind of mean. <clears throat> This kid wasn't really mean, but he was always like real quiet. But then he was like real mischievous. And always doing something. Always throwing something, doing something. But I was always the same all the time. I was always pretty much rambunctious as a kid. So if you've got a rambunctious child, you're thinking, what are you going to do with him? He's wild, he's crazy. I can't keep that with him. He's going to be a preacher. Okay, you're okay, he's going to be a preacher. But I remember man in this kid, every time in his mom, something would happen at a church. And I was never a tattletale. 
I took pride in that, that I never threw anybody under the bus. But this kid always something, he threw, he threw a rock one time in the parking lot, broke a car window. And then he blamed it on me. Because he didn't really blame it on me. He didn't stand up for me to say it was him. He didn't fess up. So then I'm the one, because I was out there, and his mom's like, every time you with that boy, every time. <laughs> I was like, dude, I ain't throwing nothing. I ain't doing nothing at that time. But I got blamed. I didn't do it. There was one time we were in a youth group room. And he falls back. He was doing something. So he went, oh, oh, oh. And falls back and puts his elbow through the window of the church. Always breaking something. They come back there. And his mom blames me for pushing him. I ain't touched him. After that, we were in high school. We were in ninth grade. And my dad was now in the church. And I said, son, I can't believe you. You're in ninth grade. You're in high school, son. And I quit acting like that. I said, I ain't doing that. Ah, uh, yeah, and that's uh, you know, then you never do anything. I know, I mean, for real. If I did it, I tell you I did it. I didn't do it. I didn't push to do it. And uh, so after that, I told him, I told him, okay, I said, listen. He said, for you tell him one more time, I said, I'm punching you face. <laughs> and he said, I said, you get me in trouble any time again, man. I'm just telling you. I'm playing. He was like, what? I said, for real, man, I'm going to punch you in the face. I said, that's the way I have to deal with this now. I said, you, you. Pretty good sized boy. I said, but I'm going to punch you right in the face. I said, I'm tired of it. I said, I'll get in trouble for that. I said, it'll be fine, but I'm punching you in the face. Never told on me again. Never let me take the blame for it. He breaks something. He's like, oh, it was me. It was me. And all kinds of stuff. But it was, uh, y'all laugh at it like this. Like, it's a little bit talking about big like that. You keep telling on me, I'll punch you in the face. I'm just kidding. If I didn't do anything. But anyway. So, so you have this, but you have all this. And it seemed like every time I was around Wayne, uh, oh, did I say his name? I got in trouble. And when, and then, but, so when I was around certain other people, I didn't get in any trouble or wasn't around anything that was really bad. Bad company corrupts good morals. And so here, you have this Noah, though. Noah still, even if you're in a situation where all is bad, you're still never alone as a Christian. You still have the presence of God within you as a Christian, you got God, the Holy Spirit, you got a son Gene, you got all these things on your side to take a stand. And Noah, with all the inclination of people's hearts, all the inclination of people's hearts, it was all evil. Noah found grace and favor in the eyes of God. Such so we say that Noah pleased God. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful passage of Scripture that you go from this sad passage. God is sorry. For making man, and he's going to wipe man off the face of the earth. Well, if he did that, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't know any different, but we wouldn't be here. And he says, there's Noah. Noah and his family, and he's striving to do what's right. Because Noah, just like Enoch, was a man of faith. He was a man of faith that we had the sorrow of God for the sin that was there. But then, with, amongst the sorrow and amongst the mess and amongst everything that was going on, we have the joy of the Lord in something that pleases God is somebody that lives a righteous and a holy life. Noah wasn't perfect, but he was striving to do the right thing. He lived by faith. And we need to live a life of faith like Enoch. Walk with God. We need to walk with God and we need to do it by faith. And I ask you today, do you truly have faith in God? And it goes back to what I started for, from in Genesis 1 about the existence of God. It is believing in the existence of God is what is going to enable us to live the life that we need to live. Do you believe in the existence of God? That it's not just acknowledging the fact that there is a God and that He does exist in that way. I'm talking about do you really believe and know the existence of God? Is God real to you? Do you understand that our God is the one who creates, who created, and He sustains this universe? Do you really believe that God is sovereign, the sovereign God? There is nothing above Him. There was nothing before Him. There is nothing after Him. He is omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful. He is God. Do you know Him? Do you know that? And when, she, when God becomes real in your life, and His Son Jesus becomes real, because as I say so many times, we go through these Old Testament Scriptures, 
We look and we see men like Noah. We see men like Enoch. We've got it better than they had. We have Jesus. We have the Spirit that indwells us under the new covenant. They did not have this. We have it better than these men. And I wonder at times, do we in the church in the year 2012, do Christians really believe that God exists? Do they really know Him? Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith in God, knowing Him, growing in Him. Pretty soon you're going to be hearing some different things that we're striving to do here to grow people. We don't want to grow, as one preacher said, we don't want to grow a mile wide and an inch deep. We want to be like Saul. Y'all remember Saul? Deep and wide, deep and wide. I used to think, does that have a spiritual thing whatsoever? And then you go, hmm, and why, hmm, and why. And I was a kid, Gene, I came like, hmm, and hmm, hmm, and hmm, and hmm, and hmm, and hmm. And I'm like, what is this? We say this is silly. But then, uh, but then that's, but that's what we need. We need to be growing deep. Deep. <laughs> deep and wide in our faith. Growing, and that's what we want here. We want to have, we're talking about big trees, big trees with deep roots. So that when the things of this world come our way, we'll be able to stand strong. And as I mentioned, mentioned the nobles and their faith this past week, that when that storm came their way and all those storms were hitting upon them and hitting upon them, they still said, we serve. I saw the posters and talked to them and sat with them. We still serve a big God. We still trust God through this, no matter what. That's faith. And I ask today, if, they, if, 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 the, if the news would not have been what we wanted it to be, where would your faith be today? We say, oh, it's a joyous time. It's a great time. It's a joyous time. Would you still be satisfied in God and in your faith in God if some news comes your way? Do you really know God? Knowing Him. Growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, as it says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. We're really going to be pushing that here at Eastern Pines Church of Christ. We can get numbers. I can, I got all kinds of ideas and all kinds of marketing techniques that we can do. That I can we could go out here and if they turn me loose, we can have five, six hundred people here next week. We can have a thousand here possibly next week if we did all kinds of different things. But we want to do it the right way, not just have people here. We want to make sure the people that come are growing and seeking and then growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Because we're going to grow. We're going to continue to do some things and reach out. We want to do it the right way, the godly way, the way that, that doesn't that bring glory to us, but bring glory to God. But do you believe in the existence of God? Do you know Him? Do you have a relationship with Him through Jesus Christ? Can you tell yourself that now? Only you can answer that. You can fool people. You can fool me. You can fool everybody else. But do you know that? Do you believe in the existence of God? That's what Noah and Noah believed God could do the impossible. With men... This is possible, what Jesus said, but with God, all things are possible, is what He says in Matthew chapter 19. And Noah was a man of faith, and he believed this because God comes to him, and God says, hey, guess what? This is going to rain. There's going to be some waterfalls from the sky because man's days are only 120 years, which is what He was saying from the time that you're getting this message until the flood comes, unless they repent. they got 120 years left on this earth. And so he was, he was teaching them that. And so you have, you have, uh, I can't remember where I was. What was I saying to you? Help me out. I went blank. I looked at the playground for one second. I got so excited. I got the playground. I pulled down a slide and then, and I got so excited. But all I know is that I was saying, 120 years. I was right there. 120 years. Slide. Messed me up completely. But uh, the, yeah. Nothing pop, but the rain, he, he, that everybody's going to get destroyed. There's going to be this rain. He had never seen rain. Never had ever seen it. Didn't know what it was. The Bible says that they water, God watered the earth but from, the, from the springs of the deep. So it hadn't even rained yet. He doesn't know what that is. And Noah's like, all right, cool. And I want you to build this boat. And not just any boat, but this big boat that we're going to start talking about next week. And he's like, that's cool, God, what is it? What's the boat? 
already said, and nothing is impossible with God. When you believe in His existence and you know God, you will understand that, that nothing is impossible with Him. That we have the faith, as Ken preached on that Sunday night, the faith of a mustard seed. You realize how small a mustard seed is? Small, small. If we had that small faith that if they had it today, they would put some kind of coating on it so we wouldn't lose it. That's what they had to do with tobacco seeds. What you see a tobacco seed is not a tobacco seed, it's the coating on the seed. Y'all like, yeah. We grew up in Hampton, Virginia, that is that. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, just that small, he says you can move a mountain, you can overcome anything. Nothing is impossible with God. Do you have that type of faith? In the midst of the society that we live in today, where we look around and we see a lot of evil, we see a lot of bad things. And God, I, I do believe that God is a... Is, I'm not one of these guys that cries when the Lord's coming back and all these. I do believe we're in the last days. I believe we've been living in the last days since Jesus Christ raised from the dead. I believe we're in the last days. At any time, Jesus could come back. But with all that's going on, and all that we see, and the, and the people's hearts, and the way that they are, I can't help but believe that it's, it's close and God's looking and saying, getting ready, giving that nod, saying, go get him, son. Amen. Go get him, bring him out of here. Bring him, get him out of that mess and bring him here to bring him here to me. And I so hope that's the case. I pray every day, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I want him to come back. Especially after April 15th, and I had to write that tax check. Man, <laughs> we should come before that. But anyway, I, I want him to come back. And nothing is impossible. Uh, nothing is impossible with him. We believe that and we understand that. And we live for him and we have that faith that can do the matter we can over any kind. Any problem, anything that's going on in our lives, we look and we see that I know God, and I know God can pull me through this. And God will pull me through this because that's what his word tells us. Where's your faith today? If God's looking down on the earth today, and he's writing a genealogy, would he look down and would he put your name in there? And would he say things like, and then there was DJ, and he walked with me. And would he look down and would he say, there's the earth and all the information on oh, they're evil and these people are just living the way that they want to live and I'm sorrowful for creating them and all these things. Would he say that? And then would he possibly say, but DJ, but your name pleases me. Again, we were talking this morning. It says Abraham pleased God. The scripture says Abraham was a friend of God. Of God. Could God honestly look at you and say, you please Him? If not, you can please Him today. I get right with Him. Maybe you haven't been living the way that you should be living, and you're caught up, and you haven't really been growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus, and really getting to know Him. Joey and I were talking last night about really taking time and being still and knowing that He is God and meditating on His greatness. And maybe you haven't realized great, but maybe today something's pierced you, convicted you, and you say, I'm going to rededicate my life to the Lord, and I'm going to get right with Him. And I'm going to begin doing the things that I know I'm supposed to be doing, and I'm really going to get to know God, and I'm going to realize that nothing is impossible with Him. Maybe, maybe today you never named Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You don't have a relationship with God. Today could be the day of salvation for you. We've got everything ready. The question is, are you ready? To believe, repent, confess, and be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Last week, on Sunday evening, we had two that were baptized into Christ. I praise the Lord. Billy Moore, and uh, where is she at? There is. She's hiding from me. Darlene Cox was baptized in the Christ last week. Man, maybe that's where you are. You need to start there. You can start there today. I'm going to pray. We're going to sing a song of invitation. You've had a decision to make. This so we're going to be Father God, we come to you now, and I thank you for this, uh, your word today. And that even in the midst of all evil, there's all, you always have a remnant. You always give us hope. And even... Even in the midst of all people living wrong, we can still stand, stand strong for you, and we should, and stand up for what's right and love you. But if we're gonna, if what enables us to do that is really knowing you. I know there's people in here who don't know you. Some say it.
and it's superficial. Some believe it intellectually, but they have not placed their trust in you. I'm praying for them now, and I know that there's somebody here who needs to make a decision, and I pray that they will do so before it's everlasting to you. Before you send your son back. So I pray this prayer now in the name of Jesus. Amen. We stand and uh, we come forward if you have.